Okay, so I see I'm on the air, so I'm going to go ahead and get going. So lecture seven on chirality and stereo centers. Before we get to talking about chirality, I just wanted to review some of the concepts we dealt with last time related to isomers and to molecular shape. So we talked about isomers as molecules that have the same molecular formula but different connectivity. And so the example I gave was the example of C4H9. So if we take three carbons in a row like this, we can generate two isomers of C4H9 by either placing that third methyl group up here, attached to the middle carbon, or attached to one of the end carbons. And that generates two what are called isomers. They have the same molecular formula, right? All the same number of carbons and hydrogens, but they differ in the connectivity of the atoms. Whereas the second carbon here is attached to two hydrogens, the second carbon here is attached to one methyl group, which is a CH3 group, by the way, just in case you didn't know, and a hydrogen. What we saw at the second half of last time was that molecular shape is a unique property of compounds. So that means that there are molecules that can have even the same connectivity, but still different shapes, and so they're still different compounds. So we saw, for instance, the example of these two diols, one in which both hydroxyls are coming out at us, and one with that same skeleton in which one hydroxyl is coming out and one is going back. And these molecules actually have different shapes, and they're not superimposable, so they're actually different chemically. So we would call these stereoisomers. And because they have different internal dimensions, right, the distance between the two oxygens differs in the two molecules, we would actually call these diastereomers. Today we're going to learn about a second kind of stereo stereoisomer in which all of the internal distances are still the same, but the molecules are still non-superimposable and they're actually chemically different, and these are called enantiomers. So we'll hit on that in a second, but before we get to that, I wanted to talk about um, a little bit more generally. I'm going to jump over this slide, actually, and talk about chirality. So if you take a minute to look at your two hands, what you'll notice about the hands is that in terms of their composition, assuming you have five fingers on both hands, they are equivalent, right? You have all of the same number of fingers on both hands, and the, the composition is more or less the same of both hands, barring any minor imperfections. And what you should also notice is that the relative distances between your fingers is all the same. So the thumb is next to the index fingers, next to the middle finger, etc. on both of your hands. So all of the internal distances, if you will, in your hands are the same. And yet your hands are clearly not the exact same object spatially because they can't be superimposed. If you take one hand and place the palm of one hand on the back of another, you'll see that your thumbs don't overlap and your fingers are going kind of backwards. And if we were to get your fingers aligned correctly, then your thumbs wouldn't line up. And there's no way for your hands to be superimposed without chopping off your thumb and moving it to the other side and rearranging your fingers. So clearly there's something different between your hands, even though all of their internal distances and all of their composition is the same. And that's this property of what we call, for lack of a better term, handedness. And molecules can have handedness also. So molecules, there are molecules that can have all the same connectivity, all the same uh, molecular formula and internal distances, and yet still differ in their, um, in their chemical properties. Um, and these are called enantiomers. And I'll jump back to the enantiomer slide uh, right now so that we can talk about these structures in more detail. All right, so here you see two hypothetical molecules with the same formula, connectivity, and internal dimensions. So what you should notice here is that C is just as close to A as it is in this case, although it may, may not look like it, keep in mind this carbon is tetrahedral. So actually, in fact, those distances are equal. 
It's just the perspective that makes C look a little bit closer to A in this structure than it is in this structure. Similarly with D and B, these distances are both the same. And of course, the AB distance is all the same. The CD distance is the same in both molecules. So all of these internal distances are the same. And of course, the molecular formula is assuming that A, B, C, and D are the same structures in both molecules are exactly the same. And yet, the two molecules are not superimposable. To see this, if I clear the whiteboard here, notice that here we've got C and D perfectly aligned for overlap. So if I were to take molecule 1, or the molecule on the right, let's say, and superimpose it on molecule 2, kind of in the way I've been doing already, I would get C and D to line up perfectly, right? However, B would come up on this side and A on the right, which is the opposite of what we have in molecule 2. So that what I'm drawing over molecule 2 is just molecule 1 translated. If we tried to match up A and B, well, that would switch C and D around. So what we're seeing is that the two molecules are not superimposable, and thus they're not the same molecule. An interesting thing about enantiomers is that even though they're technically not the same compound, they do display a lot of the same properties. In terms of reactivity and even molecular orbitals, the molecular orbitals and, uh, and things of that nature are identical in energy. So... The only difference is that the appearance of the molecular orbitals are mirror images of each other. And we'll come back to this in a second. But because all of the internal distances are the same in enantiomers, all of the chemistry associated with all of these groups is exactly the same. Because their influence on one another is exactly the same in both molecules. So coming back to this idea of mirror images, if you take a look at these two structures and imagine placing a vertical mirror between them. So imagine we took a mirror and we plopped it down right here. What we would see is that if molecule 2 looked in the mirror, it would see molecule 1 as its image. So what that tells you is that these two molecules are related as mirror images, right? So they have this imminent designation of being what we call non-superimposable mirror images. And I'm going to write this down because it's a really important phrase to keep in mind and really understand. They're mirror images because when one molecule looks in a mirror, it sees the other molecule. And they're non-superimposable for the reason I just covered. You can't superimpose one on two perfectly. So here we see an example of two what are called chiral molecules. They have the property that they possess a non-superimposable mirror image. So chiral molecules possess non-superimposable mirror images. I'll abbreviate that as non-sup. Because the, the fact of being chiral or not can have some interesting effects on reactivity and physical properties, which we'll visit next time, um, it, it's very useful to know whether a molecule is chiral or not. And because chirality is a spatial property, we can simply look at the shapes of molecules to determine whether or not they're chiral. So that's what I'm going to cover now. We're going to take a look at how you can predict whether a molecule is chiral or not. And one thing you might suspect, and one thing that is certainly true, is that if a molecule possesses a carbon with four different things attached, then it's very likely to be chiral.